like um, life went on hold and we got disconnected from the world and I wanted to stay connected to people so I put this uh, note on Instagram to find people to photograph and I was overwhelmed and humbled by how many people were willing to be part of that and how much everybody was craving a connection and a human connectivity so I started going and photographing people at their window so to, to prove that it's physical distancing but not a social distancing and I was able to create a relationship with people in the way across the class and I felt like it resonated uh, with many people because it felt like it was something we're all living uh, at the same time. Um, so there and in most of my work I focus on a typical age group and on womanhood and girlhood and here it was it, for me it was everybody anybody who replied and was willing to be photographed I went there and photographed them for me it was important to include the kids the adults the couples the older people and I'm hoping this exhibition shows the nice variety of the people I was able to Good evening. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Good evening, Rania. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Gisela Carbonella. I'm the curator here at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. We're about to hear a lot more about this exhibition and the process um, in tonight's, uh, tonight's event with artist Rania Matars. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Tonight's speaker is our Thomas P. Johnson Distinguished Artist and Scholar, Rania Matar whose exhibition, Rania Matar, on either side of the window, Portraits During COVID-19, is on view, and you saw a little bit of it until May 9th. Rania Matar was born and raised in Lebanon and moved to the United States in 1984. As a Lebanese-born American artist and as a mother, her cross-cultural experience and personal narrative informs her photography. Matar's work has been widely exhibited in museums worldwide, including the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Carnegie Museum of Art, the National Museum of Women and the Arts, Minneapolis Institute of Art, and now, of course, here at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, among many other institutions. Her work is part of the permanent collections of several museums, institutions, and private collections. A mid-career retrospective of her work was recently on view at the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art, and at the American University of Beirut Museum. Matar received a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018, a 2017 Mellon Foundation Artist in Residency Grant, a 2011 Legacy Award at the Griffin Museum of Photography, a 2011 and 2007 Massachusetts Cultural Council Artist Fellowships. In 2008, she was a finalist for the Foster Award at the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston with an accompanying solo exhibition. Matar has published three books, L'Enfant Femme uh, in 2016, A Girl and Her Room in 2012, Ordinary Lives in 2009, and she's currently working on her fourth book, titled She, which will be published later this year by Radius Books. Matar is currently Associate Professor of Photography at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and regularly offers classes, workshops, talks, class visits and lectures at museums, galleries, schools and colleges in the United States and abroad. It is my honor and my privilege to have you here tonight Rania, to talk about your work and your exhibition. We will be taking questions from the audience. So if you're joining us tonight, please submit your comments and questions for Rania. Rania, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Gisela. Thank you everybody for coming, um, taking time from your busy schedules for yet another Zoom event. Uh, I wanna thank especially actually Gisela Carbonell and Anna Heller for inviting me to exhibit this work. Uh, Barbara Elfant for introducing me to Anna a few years ago for actually another project. <laughs> um, 
But thank you, Barbara. And also, I want to thank everybody who was involved in this exhibition. Austin, Hin, Lindsay, Lexi, Lainey, and the super brilliant uh, exhibition designer, Jeff Morer, who gave me my red wall that you could see behind, behind me. Sorry, this mirror is flipped. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I had been making very briefly and how to how it all got to that work. As you mentioned, uh, Gisela, I am uh, born in Lebanon from Palestinian parents and raised in Lebanon. I came to the US in 1984 and I'm trained as an architect, not uh, as a photographer. I did a lot of art in college and I didn't get into photography till I had um, my children and I have four of them. So um, I started photography to honestly make, make better pictures of my kids and this work is uh, very important to me because I feel like it paved everything I've done since. And uh, um, is my screen shared? I'm not sure how to get it up. Okay, so my screen, is, do you guys, everybody sees my screen now? Okay. Uh, so, sorry. Um, so this is the, my red wall in the exhibition and I wanted to start with that. Uh, I'm so honored to be here in person and to see it, which was fantastic. And thank you to everybody who brought me here. Uh, it looks much better in person. <laughs> um, so I started with that image and then I'm gonna talk about the rest because this became the signature for that exhibition. and. Uh, you're going to see that young lady on the right in another photograph as well. So um, my early work uh, really consisted of me photographing my children early on. And the top picture on the left shows that. And um, I really got serious and fell in love with the medium, the craft uh, of photography, photographing my kids. And I always show, start my slideshows with some of those images because it taught me how to... Um, appreciate uh, the mundane and the everyday and find the beauty in that, but also to really strive to always uh, seek that intimacy in photography. Um, and uh, so the second picture on the right is um, a picture I made in Lebanon in 2005. Eventually, uh, after, two, after September 11, my whole, um, you know, up to that point, I was making pictures of my kids, still working part time as an architect and raising four children. So it was chaos. Uh, and but after September 11, my whole sense of identity shifted. Um, I'm from Lebanon. I'm living in the U.S. The whole rhetoric of them versus us kind of resonated with me. I mean, I am them. I am from the Middle East, and I, and I had become an American citizen by ne by now. Uh, and I wanted to kind of bridge that sense of my identity and come to term with it. And people I knew in Lebanon and the Middle East were kind, hospitable, loving. It wasn't all that the news was portraying. So I started going back to Lebanon and making photographs in uh, Lebanon. And I found myself very drawn to photographing women and mothers. Um, it wasn't a conscious decision. I had this incredible access to the women. I was in awe of the women, how they were holding their homes together and raising their kids. And uh, this body of work eventually became my uh, my first book, Ordinary Lives, that included work from uh, Palestinian, Palestinian refugee camp, work from the aftermath of war, um, work about the devout Christian life in Lebanon, and also about uh, the whole sense of the veil and why women were wearing it. So at some point though, when this book was published, I became interested in my daughter who was by then becoming a young teenager, my older daughter, and how she was transforming. And the, bot and, um, the bottom picture on the left shows that project. That's not my daughter, but eventually this work turned into my third, my second book that, I, that was uh, A Girl in Her Room. Uh, and I started photographing teenage girls in the United States where I live uh, and started with a lot of friends of my daughters and eventually decided that I want to photograph each young woman by herself. And the bedroom seems to have that um, intimacy where the, the young woman could be herself and um, where she could explore her sense of identity and who she is. So it turned into a project. And when I started the work in the US, I realized that at that point, 
that was 10 years ago, 25 years earlier, I was exactly those young women in a different country, different culture. So I decided to start photographing in Lebanon as well. So I would go back and forth. These two young women at the bottom are Lebanese. The work is completely mixed in in my book and the way I present it, because for me, it's about that shared humanity of growing up. Um, even though each young woman is completely individual and uh, has her own sense of identity, I felt like all the women, I mean, whether they're here or there, they're coming to terms with becoming a woman while still being a girl, but all the transformation. And this work uh, became part of an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston titled She Who Tells the Story, Women Photographers from Iran and the Arab World. And uh, some people would come and ask the curator, we thought you're only showing Arab women, referring to Christilla, the young woman on the left. And she told them, I am only showing Arab women. So for me, that was an important way to kind of demystify that all women from the Middle East do not come in one shape and one size, but there's a whole layer and differences. Um, so after that work, and I, I, I'm talking a little bit about that work because originally some of that work was going to be shown at the museum here before COVID happened and we went on a different track. Um, so after that work, I became fascinated with my younger daughter who has who was prepubescent and was, her body was changing. So I started this project photographing uh, the preteen young woman, girl. Uh, and it's here, it became very much about the gaze and the relationship to the camera. Uh, and you, these are two images on the top here. And then I started following some of those uh, girls over the years and re photographed them after puberty in a project I called Becoming. Um, so the bottom left is that same girl photographed uh, about four years apart. And I became interested in the whole sense of the passing of time that we also see in uh, the work about the windows. Um, so as you see, my work is very autobiographical in the sense that it's following my daughters as they're growing up. And it's also following my own life uh, as a mother and as a woman who's getting older. Uh, the two pictures in the bottom right are from the series that came next that, uh, that I titled Unspoken Conversation. When my older daughter left for college, I realized how much my role as a mother was about to change. Um, if she's growing up, I'm getting older and, and I'm learning, I lost my mother very young and I'm learning that, for, that whole mother-daughter relationship firsthand. So I turned it into a project, photographing uh, women on the, uh, the young woman on the verge of leaving home with the mother experiencing that same transition. It's similar transition of having their daughters leave home. The, the last picture at the bottom, uh, right is a little bit the next generation and i'm going to just talk briefly about that um so this is a very famous lebanese artist her name is uget kalan and i photographed her with her daughter brigitte and i could feel the emotions between the mother and the daughter that were so strong so and the mother looked like she wasn't very present so i got very emotional i started crying when i started crying they both of them started crying so i put down my camera and the mother who looked like she wasn't there told me emotions are important, don't stop. So she gave me permission to make that photograph. And the reason I speak about all this is that whole sense of intimacy and collaboration is very important for me in my work. Uh, eventually, I, when um, my daughters left home, I was very grateful and honored to get a residency at Kenyon College in Ohio. And that started a whole new project for me. And it was also metaphorically the ages of my daughters now. It's like these young women have left home. Um, so I fell in love with the Ohio landscape and I fell, um, and I wanted to photograph these women on campus who had left home are now making that transitional space of their life home. So whereas my and whereas my older work focused very much about the the domestic and the familial uh, space environment, this work is photographing these women in that space when they leave home, and uh, and it's outside often. Um, and there's a lot. It became also a sense. There's a lot of sense of texture and collaboration that came at play in this work. I had, uh, you could see, I have so much hair. I had lost 
my hair. I was losing a lot of my hair at that time. Uh, I never found out what it is, so they said it was stress. But I became obsessed with that sense of physicality and texture. And I felt that, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back here. And and for me, it's also this generation of young women who are always um, on social media and on they are living a parallel life on Instagram almost. And I wanted to focus very much on the present moment, on that collaboration we're creating, on empowerment and on their physicality. So um, eventually I also took this work to Lebanon and often the texture in Lebanon is not that lush texture of rural Ohio, but it's a lot about these textured walls and some of the, um, actually, I'm going to go back, sorry. And I, the, the whole sense of the hair, I also became interested in the head covering as well in the same way that it actually expresses hair in some way. So um, I started approaching young women to, women to photograph them and I emphasized the collaborative aspect of this body of work. So here, for example, this is Rachel and she, told me that her best friend is her horse. So eventually I met her at the barn in Connecticut and we made that photograph. Uh, I was very lucky to get a Guggenheim fellowship for this body of work. And at the same time, my youngest son had left home. So all of a sudden I'm empty nester with a Guggenheim fellowship. So I was able to travel a lot to make this work. So I went a few times again to Ohio, but I was able to travel to different spaces. So here, this is a young woman in rural Ohio again, and this is not cotton, this is snow. And she dressed like that and every few pictures would have to run and she would put her coat on and I would cover my camera. And so I'm actually delighted I got a great picture out of it. Um, and this is a young woman who actually approached me on Instagram. And um, I was fascinated by that because she's fully covered with the black, but she wanted to collaborate. And she's somebody I ended up working with quite a bit. And you're gonna see some of her images here. Uh, her Instagram page said, follow me, I'm toxic. So I became intrigued and uh, she's very artistic and creative and it shattered even my own stereotypes about the full covering. So. I'm gonna go th quickly through those. And if you have questions, I'm happy to come back to them. Um, a lot of it is a combination of luck, of being at the right place at the right time, of honestly, the young woman having ideas and making me run with it with, it, with them. And uh, some of this work uh, got included in a show that was called Live Dangerously at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And I love that they saw that in the work. So I kind of ran with it. And it became also about risk taking and pushing the limit of uh, the comfort zone of creativity. And I'm showing the two images here together. Um, well, this is the young woman I spoke about on the left. Um, and she, this is literally at the border with Israel. I mean, there were Israeli soldiers on top and she kind of just jumped in the water. And I thought that was very beautiful. And the woman on the right is Natalie, whose picture is currently at the museum at her window that I showed at the beginning. And I showed them together because I felt like I had a similar relationship to both of them um, in the sense that I've collaborated them many times with them over the years. They all bring their friends. They all are very creative. So before COVID, I had this idea where I wanted to do a back and forth dialogue between them. So I connected them both on Instagram and I wanted to do like a picture as a response of one to the other and keep going with that. So maybe this will happen again, we'll see. And then COVID happened and nothing. Um, so this is the, one of the photos that we exhibited at the National Museum of Women and the Arts. And uh, I love it. This was in Miami. The, she was on spring break from Wichita, Kansas, and I was there with my daughter from Boston, and we connected there. And, you know, she's black albino and stunningly beautiful. And it just was completely serendipity that it worked out to make the pictures and that, that day when all the crowds were there, um, when it was so cloudy and the sea was like that. And, uh, but when I talk about empowerment, I, it meant the word to me that um, I sent her a message to tell her that her picture was going to be at the museum in DC. So she actually flew to the museum and then she took that photograph and the museum ended up buying that picture and she left this whole note on Facebook about, um, you know, like, thank you for seeing the beauty in me. And uh, so that meant the world to me. Um, 
So I'm going to go quickly through those. So when I when COVID happened, I had been working on this project for about two and a half years. And because I had been traveling a lot, I hadn't spent enough time editing the work. And when when we went on lockdown last March, I, I started making eight by 10 prints of all so many of these images and I laid them all on the floor. And I started realizing how many I had that had to do with the sense of the inside and the outside and the window. And um, which I hadn't realized I had before because I wasn't looking for it, but maybe because we're stuck inside, I started noticing this. Uh, and so I, at the same time, I had six young adults at my house. My four kids came home plus two of their cousins. So if I wasn't working in my studio, I was in the kitchen. And I was, uh, um, a couple of times I'd be on, on the kitchen sink and through my kitchen window, across the yard to my neighbor's window, I would see her at her kitchen, in her kitchen. And I thought that was so interesting, this whole kind of relationship across two, two yards and two windows. And then one day I found her sitting and reading in a window seat and I had an aha moment. I'm like, this is so beautiful. So I found this image that I had made a few years ago, actually on my, on my cell phone. And I posted it on Instagram. I don't know if you guys could read, but it says greater Boston people, friends, students, whatever. If you live 30 minutes from Brookline where I live, I would love to come and make your picture across your window. And I was in awe and humbled and incredibly surprised by the response that I got to speak to how much people wanted to stay connected and if you remember the early days of last march i mean life kind of just stopped instantly so all of a sudden i, I might have been this first person to go visit people and i didn't know what i was doing i thought it just seems like a cool idea but i did buy a digital camera because i was shooting film up to that moment and uh, nobody was developing film and i realized there was an immediacy to this work little did we know that we'll still be in it a year from then at that point, I thought, oh my God, I need to do this and I need to do it quick. So I bought a digital camera. So it was all new to me. And I started going to people's home and finding a way to, to collaborate across the window. And as you, you, as you saw in my older work, collaboration and intimacy is an important part of my process. So how do you do that across a barrier? And uh, it was really a way for me to learn how to get to that. And it's pretty incredible that, um, you know thinking originally i thought you know i'm gonna go drive around take people's pictures and move on but it there was something about again the early days where time has stopped so people are not in a rush anytime i ask people okay when can i come they're like come anytime so i was not in a rush they were not in a rush so eventually the shoot turned into a good 45 minutes to an hour so i was able to recreate that whole collaboration with people this is one of the early ones and uh that almost became the signature of this project. They're both tango dancers. So um, that's, she wore the red and the lipstick. And, uh, but there were also somebody, she was telling me, it's like somebody told them, you look like on, you, you look like you're on a train and the train is moving. She said, um, on a, she said, they look like you're on a moving train. They said, but she said, no, we're actually stuck inside and, but life is moving outside. So I thought that was a kind of an interesting, way to look at it and if you remember the early days people i would go to people's home the families were together including myself i mean my family came home uh, but also people would like welcome me in whatever they were wearing so people were uh again in their pajamas and their sweats and i kind of liked capturing that so it would so you see those and uh the family on the on the on the right here i mean the girl was bored and she made my photograph i wanted to step out of the picture so that's just something kind of cool that's going on and then i realized there's also this sense of the mother wanting to protect the kids and here you see in both those images is like the hands reaching into the the, the younger person you know the the, the daughter uh, and then I started realizing as well that the same way I was photographing for my she project and working with the uh, the relationship of the young woman to the background, this was happening again here because the background was often reflected into the glass. So it was so interesting to realize that it kind of all came full circle for me. 
So here it became, I started knowing a little more what I was after. And when I saw all that reflection, I literally would ask her, do you have a red shirt? So it became, again, this thing that we're collaborating to make a, to make a fun or to make art, really. Um, and this similar happened here where there was the pink flowers. I had a very, I was on the top of a stoop. If you guys know Boston, I mean, this is this in, in the Back Bay area where you have all the steps. I didn't have any room to go back. This is the only place I could photograph her. And uh, I, in a way, I love that I could only see the one eye and she had that dress that matched the flowers. So it's, anyway, um, and here, this is, um, these kind of happened a little bit, which is also part of the process. Uh, for Nadav, the young man on the left, I was photographing his mother and it, the light was actually very bright before. And as it got darker and the sky became so blue i almost saw him in the background with that blue shirt and i was just gesturing to him to come over and i ended up using his photograph because i thought that was so beautiful and again you almost see the one eye and you could read more into it this the whole sense of uncertainty uh, but you also see the reflection of the houses across the street and the lights that are adding to the layers of that the woman on the on the right she um the whole thing was very gray and she was going in to actually go get more colorful clothes and as she turned around i just saw her hair with relationship to the tree and the sky and i'm like oh my god please stop and then she stopped and i thought i just want to see your hand and she just kind of put her hand in her hair and i thought that was a beautiful moment so how am i communicating with them i'm often screaming sometimes we have two phones on uh on speaker one inside one outside sometimes people open another phone on the side so there's all sorts of way we're communicating and a lot of gesturing uh, this this is an and then i started getting a lot of the stories because you know everybody's story life went on hold and there's so many beautiful stories that came out of it or sad stories or interesting stories anyway so here uh, this is juliana and her um she was supposed to get married in April and her wedding kept getting postponed. So she, so we made the photo of her wearing her wedding gown and then she didn't want her husband to be to see the photo. Eventually she got, they got married in September but I photographed her before and I couldn't show that photograph till after they got married. But I also have one of her where uh, she, uh, he sat in the front and she came and hugged him from behind. So. She, and he started crying, he got so emotional. Uh, so it's a, it's, it was a great story, but I love that image. So I ended up picking this one. But the other one, he so she was wearing her wedding gown and hugging him, so he couldn't see that she was wearing the getting, wedding gown, but he knew it. Um, and, and this is a great story. Um, this is Susan, and uh, on the left, you see that she was pregnant, and on the right is after she had the baby. Uh, so, but this project not only made, made me meet so many new people, uh, there was something beautiful that it connected me to people I knew and almost forgot about. And it makes you realize our life was always like, like a running train. It was always on, on a fast pace. And there was something about slowing down uh, and making time for people you like. So the, the husband was the son of our old babysitter. And he was a little older than my kids, but he often came with her and would play with my children. And he messaged me on Instagram saying, would you like to come and photograph my wife who's eight months pregnant? I mean, I still remember her as a 10 year, 10, remember him as a 10 year old boy. All of a sudden he's like a 30 something man and his wife is pregnant. So it's beautiful because it reconnected me to a family that I loved and was part of our life growing up. And, um, and that we never saw because everybody's so busy. But it also, this became interesting for me because there was a sense of the passing of time. Again, we all thought this was gonna last two weeks, a month, but here, you know, she had the baby and then the baby, this is the baby's first Christmas. So we went from July to, I mean, from the first one might've been in April to July to, to Christmas. And now she's pregnant again. So I think I'm gonna go photograph her again. But I love the whole sense of the brush coming into the photos always. And um, I don't know, I thought it was, it was a nice touch. And then um, again, I felt for the kids. So where a lot of, as I said at the beginning, a lot of my work, I'm focusing on a specific age group and I'm really following kind of my daughter's life here. I wanted to photograph all the ages. So, uh, and I felt for these young 
kids who didn't know what's happening, who can't go to school anymore. And, uh, and I felt for their parents, oh my God. So um, this for me expressed a lot of the boredom that was happening. But also if you look at this, the landscape behind her was pretty dark and this is also the kid. But then the, again, the sense of the passing of time it went from early spring, which is pretty dark in Massachusetts to the later spring to the summer and we're still in it. Um, so here you can see the reflections of the tulips in the back and, and, um, and the, green, the lush greenery that was happening. And again, I wanted to show that same sense of the reflection of the landscape into the picture that gives you the sense of the timing, but also the sense of all the families coming together. So in the left, you see that it was very dark and then we see the, the summer in the, in the picture on the right. And again, the relationships that were happening, everybody's at home. Uh, you have the significant other staying over at the parents' house. You have the couples who maybe are sick of each other, whatever you want to read it. But I think there was a sense of a lot of that dynamic of relationship, family relationships happening. Uh, and these are two sisters. The younger sister is adopted from Ethiopia, but they adore each other. And uh, so that was a beautiful moment. And here it was uh, kind of funny. This is... Uh, this is the au pair who barely arrived to, to the US and started working with them and then they went on shutdown. But I love how the daughter's looking to her and the whole attitude in between them. And then I realized as time went by, it, it, early on it was a lot of people wearing their pajamas and their sweats and as time went on, people started dressing up for my shoots and people, and there was a whole sense of the performance that was happening. So it's again, as if that window became like a stage set or the, or literally a frame of a, of a stage set, I want to say. So here again, she's a tango dancer, um, but I love how she just filled up the whole frame. Uh, here, this is my friend Marina on the, on the right, on the left. And, uh, I mean, all she needs is, I wish she had a glass of wine there, but again, she wore all that thread and the sunglasses and the lipstick for the picture. And on the right, this is Cyrus, who uh, is an Iranian American um, um, non-binary. He defines as non-binary. And uh, I love it that he wore his mother and he advertises on Instagram uh, that he's wearing his mother's not come the Gaston shirt. Um, but again, there's a sense of a whole performance for me. And again, I love how the background is becoming, like there was a whole blurriness of being inside and out. And I feel like in some of those, you could see that with what's reflected in the glass, you could see some of the what's inside, but you could see what's outside reflecting on it. Everything feels blurred in that sense. And this one um, is, is a picture that um, this woman had just bought that store um, that says like charms and rocks and uh, dream catchers and I couldn't go in and I photographed her and then before right as I, went, I was on my way to leave she asked me if I could make a picture for her and uh, and I said of course and she put these two rocks one that says blessing and one that says smile and I'm like oh my god that's my picture but the cool thing that I forgot to mention is um a lot of people left for me things at the door hanging and she left for me two little rocks as well and one said courage and one said thank you so there was something beautiful about that whole connecting to people when life was not uh was shutting down and and it was very touching for me like i thought oh my god i'm taking so much of people's time but i realized people were welcoming somebody coming to their window. And the fact that they would leave to me like roses of chocolate or chocolates or cards or or flowers or little rocks, everybody would have them hanging out my door was immensely touching for me. Um, so I usually end the this, this slide, I'm gonna keep going because I ended up adding a few images um, more recently. I mean, now, um, you know, I've, Get, we're getting out a lot, a little bit more, but I'm still not not going into people's home. And somebody introduced me to Ferris, who slash Sultana, who is um, a drag queen, a Palestinian 59 year old drag queen. So I love that part of the story. And I photographed him first as a man and as he got dressed up, but actually my favorite ended up being the one in the middle, um, which is this one. And then again, um, the sense that, 
despite all life is, go is still happening. I mean, people are having babies and life is going on. So these are two more recent images. Um, I'm gonna try now for the, for, the, for the rest. I mean, some of the images that are here, I wanna re-photograph people a year later. And I started rekindling, re restarting the contact for this conversation. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about this because the museum was a bit involved and this was a big part of my year last year. Um, the explosions that happened in Lebanon on August 4th uh, were, it was a rough year. I mean, we thought we're dealing with COVID and not being able to see family and friends and get it and people dying. And then, bam, there was an explosion in Lebanon uh, that was pretty massive. And uh, the only way I knew how to deal with that was for me to right away before it got old and people forgot about it offer uh like an, a print and uh, for sale to raise money and the same way i was humbled with the windows project by people welcoming me to their home and leaving me little trinkets here i was humbled so i offered the picture on the left first as a fundraiser and i was not giving them away cheap i was selling smaller prints for a thousand dollars and I was extremely humbled how the first one sold out, an addition of 30 within the first five hours. I didn't even have time to shut the fundraiser, so an extra three went with it. So I had to make it 30 plus three APs. Uh, and I was very honored that the museum bought one and where the museum, Cornell Museum, was one of the first people to respond to that. And, and I was really, really very touched by that. So I thought I would mention this. Uh, so I offered another print after that because I thought I'm able to help Lebanon. And uh, so the other one ended up selling out as well within uh, five days. And the reason I mentioned this is I chose this past year to really focus on the kindness that people and the kindness, the the the, the the human connection. And for me, that was part of that as well. Uh, so I ended up going back to Lebanon. I'm gonna show very briefly some of those. I ended up going back to Lebanon after the explosions and thinking that I wanted to document the explosion and I de decided I don't want to. I wanted to decide to, to really photograph the beauty and the strength of the women. And, um, and I did some, so I'm showing very briefly some of those. And here, this is Ala again. And if you look right past the mirror on the right is the port that was destroyed, that was uh, on the other side of it, the bombs happened. Um, and this is Samira. And I, this is a young woman I had photographed all over the, the years uh, in the Palestinian refugee camp. And now I couldn't get close to her. So we did one and I couldn't go to the camp. So we did kind of a windows project through the, through the car window. And um, so again, I wanted to focus on the beauty and the majestic strength of those, of those women, despite all the, the background that they're in. Um, and so this is the last picture I'm gonna end in because uh, a lot of this work is being published right now by Radius Book, uh, not the windows, but hopefully it will at some point. Uh, but this is my she project that's about to become a book. and. Uh, it should be available in late, late in June, late spring. So, so that's my presentation, and I don't know how to get out of this. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Rania, for sharing the stories of how human connection is, I think, the connecting thread um, in all your work and in your different bodies of work. Um, so we have time to take questions from our audience. And I just wanna mention briefly that the photograph that Rania talked about, that was um, the one that she offered for that fundraiser, will be on view at the museum this summer in another exhibition titled Multiple Voices, Multiple Stories. Um, and so you can come to the museum and, and see in there. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in here. 
one that says, how has your background uh, in architecture helped you in your photography? And I think that's an element that is so present in this particular project. <laughs> you know, I think it's present in all the projects really. Um, you know, it's the visual training that's part of who I am. And um, even when I, I mean, it's present in a girl in her room, it was pleasant, present in my kids' photos. It's extremely present in this one right now. I think it's, it might not be conscious, but I'm very aware of the environment and of every inch of everything in the frame. And uh, so I'm careful where I'm placing picture people in the photograph and I'm careful with what's in the photo. I tend to like my lines to be parallel. So I, there's a formal aspect of it that's I think is very influenced by my background in architecture. And it's not, it's not conscious. It's become something that I just, there's just, you know, that's part of who, part of the visual training I had, you know, right. and the texture, the light, I mean, everything. I think it's it's part of the of the lens, right, through which yeah. you, you approach a certain and, scene or, or a moment. Absolutely. And I don't use, um, I don't use a tripod. I don't use external lighting. I really just use my handheld camera in all my projects. So oh. it gives me a sense I'm able to easily move around and uh, and I do that quite a bit. So um, I'm very, I, and I like that possibility. I mean, every time, whenever I buy a tripod, I end up losing pieces of it or something. So I just gave up bringing it even. So. I, I have a question about, you mentioned that in your early stage as a photographer, when you went, you started going to Lebanon to photograph there, um, who did you photograph there and how did you connect with the people that you captured in Lebanon? Were they family friends or old friends of yours, or did you connect with people that you were building a new relationship? With? Yeah, sorry, I didn't show enough of this work. I don't know if I should focus more on the windows. I went to Lebanon, actually, I did not photograph friends at all. I went, uh, I mean, people became friends, just like with this project, people, I usually become friends with people after I photograph them, <laughs> because we share such an intimate moment. But I originally, I went first with a, with a cousin of mine to a Palestinian refugee camp. And when I grew up in Lebanon, my circle was very small because I grew up in a civil war. And uh, so for me to go to the Palestinian refugee camp, that's like not even 10 minutes by car from where I grew up, it was a shock to see that people lived in those conditions. And that, uh, so I became very interested in telling their story. And that was for me a turning point from not, practicing architecture anymore because I just fell in love with that. Uh, again, it was a human connection, I mean, that I made. And uh, and at some point I, I thought, I didn't know what, you know, you, every project kind of develops gradually. And uh, so I, I found myself drawn to the women. I remember see, meeting with somebody who's like, where are the men in your pictures? I'm like, oh my God, where are the men in my pictures? And I realized, you know, I'm doing personal work. I could do whatever I want, basically. So I, I owned up to the fact that I'm interested in womanhood and in girlhood. And I do have sons. I don't know if it's the fact that I lost my mother young that draws me to women, uh, or maybe that I was a girl and I am a woman. So that was the moment I started. But then after that in Lebanon, uh, I got stuck in the war in 2006 between Hezbollah and Israel. And that was traumatizing for me. And a big part of my book includes that work, which I didn't include here. Um, but that was a moment that I decided to go back and photograph the aftermath. And, uh, and then it kept growing. And at some point when this work was done, I felt like I wanted something. I thought I was going to do the work in the U.S. only for a girl in her womb. And then I realized I needed to include the Middle East. So that became for me what I did in all my work. And I think there's there's something about your work that, and there's a question that relates to this, and I'm, I'm, I think we're happy to talk about how this exhibition came here to Rollins, but I think there's something about the way that you capture people and the way that you present uh, and you set, you capture a particular moment that makes even tragic tragic moments or, or circumstances um, for us to be able to see the beauty in those mm -hmm. in those moments, to see that there is beauty in the human aspect of those experiences. And that really drew me to your work. And that relates to this question here from Mary. Um, she says, my husband and I love the collection at Rollins. 
we wonder how Rollins was fortunate enough to have this uh, exhibition. Can you share some background? So I'll share from my end and then Rania can share from her yeah. end. So um, when we started talking with Rania for a possible exhibition for uh, for our museum, it was a different body of work. It was, we were looking at the images mostly of young women, right, in, in interior settings. Um, and we, I think we hadn't started yet making selections for the exhibition when COVID happened. And Rania uh, one day shared with me, you know, I'm doing this project now and I'm posting the images here if you wanna take a look, just so that you see what, what I'm working on now. And as I started going through the images, it just, they spoke to me in a way that um, I thought this is really interesting. If we were to do this, it would be, uh, it would open in January of 20, 2021. That will be roughly the year anniversary of when the yeah. pandemic started. And so we can look back and reflect on this <laughs> event that happened. I, I had no idea, of course, that we would still be dealing with it. So for me, it, it was, um, uh, perfect timing and I thought that it would be a good opportunity to look at these images and sort of reflect back on how different people in different places experience something that affected us all. Um, and so that was from from my end uh, as a curator and thinking about bringing this project for for the museum. Uh, Rania, do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, shift? It's, in plans? Yeah, it's interesting because I had uh, I had this exhibition titled In Her Im uh, In Her Image that was mm -hmm. at the Emil Carter Museum and that it went to Cleveland. So there were 50 framed images and it showed my work from L'Enfant Femme, Prepubescent Girl, to Becoming, to A Girl in Her Room, to Unspoken Conversations. So it's covered, covered womanhood from prepubescence to middle age, really. And it covered both cultures, the Middle East, Lebanon, basically Palestinian camps and the US. So there was something timely about the exhibition. And uh, because it was framed, I was trying to think of option where to travel it. And Barbara Alphonse very generously and kindly connected me with Anna who said, yes, let's do it. So it's still available <laughs> to, to go anywhere, <laughs> but, uh, so when, when you reach out again, this life changed. So everything changed this past year. And I think the story of the show also changed. I mean, it's part of the, the new normal, right? And I'm so grateful that I'm able to even be here and see it. So I didn't even think that was gonna happen. We're delighted to have you. And, and just to hear you talk about the, the images and, and to share with everyone that, you know, we have 27 images in this exhibition, but there are a few hundred that yeah. maybe more that Rania uh, took. And so the process of speaking with her during the pandemic, uh, during quarantine, when I was working from home, sitting at my kitchen counter and looking at the images, talking yeah. with her on the phone and, and talking about each one, the stories behind each one, talking about the formal elements, the composition and the color, and then the person's captured in the, in the photograph, uh, even the process was, was really interesting to learn more about your work and about your life, Rania. Uh, we have another question Actually, here. Actually, something from, interesting about ahead. that, can I just jump in? It's, it was a different way of, for me to work because usually I shoot film. It takes me a while to get my negatives back, then I scan them and then I look at them and then I live with the work. And then I, I and I'm, as I was saying, I was editing the work after like two years of work to start working on the book. And here it was like, all of a sudden I'm shooting digital uh, and there was such an immediacy to it. Like I'm editing and photographing and preparing a show at the same time, which had never happened to me before. So in some weird way, life had stopped and went on complete like a standstill at the same time it was speeding in some weird way and i think the whole sense of time was so blurred for many of us but for me especially with that body of work yeah and, for, and now that you mention it it's, it's interesting to think back and reflect on that process because for me too every time we would narrow down a, a selection and i would feel like yeah. oh okay so here we have a group uh you would and I send you, you more would me again and you would say well i shot you know five more other people that I visited. And so all these beautiful images kept appearing. And I and I wish we had two more galleries to show more of this work because it's really beautiful. It's and we had just, to keep changing the selection. It just, it, just it, it was just a rich experience of being able to have material that was, you know, that is both 
uh, beautiful formally, but that each image tells a story in such a profound and, and poetic way. At least that's how I experience these photographs. We have another question here from Anna. Have you ever taken photographs that are not portraits? For example, buildings. You know, uh, I have, but I, I love people. I love working with people. I love working with women. Um, so I like including the background in there, the buildings, but um, no, not really, I didn't follow through with it. I mean, interestingly enough, this past, last time I was in Lebanon, I discovered kind of old buildings that has been, that have never been rebuilt since the civil war. And uh, I was supposed to have a shoot with somebody there. And then she's like, her whole ha family had COVID. So I went without her and ended up photographing the place without people in it. And I actually was excited by the, by the photos. And it's funny because I was showing them to my husband. He's like, where is she? It's like, I'm like, who's she? It's like the she. Where? <laughs> so um, I don't know what I'll do with them or if it would lead to something or not. But I am aware of the space and I love those places that I found. And I don't know if I would build on that or if I would include people in them yet. So this could be the next thing I, I yeah. work on. Maybe this is the next, the next part of yeah. a, a project um, coming up. But it sounds like that human connection and just getting to know the people that you're working with, that is, it's very important to you. And it sounds like it, it may inform the way that you capture them or the way that you see them through your lens. And, and the final image that we see has part of you in it as well. Yeah, and I really love working with those women. I mean, with the window, it was great because it, I included everybody, which was interesting. But I, um, I really, really love working with those young women. And as they're going through the ages, um, like now with, the, with their 20s, or early 30s or any time, I mean, I feel like uh, I love including them in the process. I feel like when I'm working with them, they are literally the most important person in the world for me at the time that we're collaborating. And I love that relationship that gets created and the dynamic and the back and forth. And, uh, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, another question here from Yolanda. She says, thank you for this beautiful presentation. I am curious if you shoot with a medium format camera. Yes, I do. Actually, I shoot with a medium format camera. Uh, I have uh, a Mamiya 7 II, which is kind of a big range finder. So it's, it's medium format. The negatives are big but it's not heavy and clunky. So I could literally move around with it. And I ended up buying a Fuji film, uh, 50, I don't remember the number of it, but I bought a medium format Fuji to, uh, for my Windows project. Somehow they weren't that expensive and it's honestly been a great investment for me to get them. So yes, I do. I feel like for me, the large format, it's, 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 I mean, must, it probably slows the process too much and digital could speed the process too much. So for me, the medium format was a nice kind of way to work. Um, I, it slows it enough because, you know, I'm shooting film and I cannot just keep clicking. So I'm very deliberate. And even moving to the digital medium format, I'm still shooting the same way. So, um, yes. How did I you guess? Question. How did she guess? Oh, I don't know. Maybe she's also a photographer. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, are you, do you have plans to publish a book with uh, the works in this project? You know, I probably would. Um, right now, because I'm still engrossed in the other book, I'm, it might be a couple of years, but I feel like the more distance we have from it, it's like I, if I, I would like to publish one, I probably would like to do it when COVID is officially over. Okay. Because then I feel like it's done and we're looking back at something. I don't want to, you know, does that make sense? That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. If that it ever sense. is, right? <laughs> it has well, to be I, over. I hope it will and I hope that <laughs> soon. And and yes, I hope that you're able to to share uh, other images that didn't make it into the exhibition, maybe yeah. as part of as part of that book. Well, we're nearing the the end of our time here today. I want to thank um Rania for your uh, kindness in sharing throughout this last year that we have been working together and tonight with our audience, sharing your process, uh, your life experiences as a mother and as a photographer. And uh, we wanna thank all of you who joined us tonight. 
if you want to know more about the exhibition, there are a few ways that you can engage with it. You can, of course, visit us. Uh, the exhibition will be on view until May 9th. Uh, you can visit us online at rawlins.edu slash CFAM. And you can uh, view a 360 virtual tour of the exhibition if you're not able to make it in person. And there's also a uh, booklet that we publish with all the images that are included in the exhibition and an interview with Rania where we talk a little bit more uh, about the project and about her work that you can uh, get in the museum store. So we hope to see you very soon. Thank you again, Rania. Stay safe, everyone. Have a great night.